There I am. Let's retweet this. And let's retweet this. And let's click back over here. I can get rid of this. I'm going to hold out for just a second, see if we've got any kind of chat activity. Just make sure that that's still working. And that looks like it's working okay. Get back to there. All right. I think we're live. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome back to another uh, weekly installment of the SGGQA podcast, the Monday Morning Tech Chat Show. I am Juan Carlos Bagnell, aka Some Gadget Guy, and we uh, we spend some time every Monday morning talking through some news stories and and having a little Q and A with the various. Uh, web communities out there streaming on whatever platform you might be currently watching this on. I mean, of course, only just YouTube. We're, we're not streaming this to anywhere else. I'm already seeing some people jump in. Hadid Tamimi, Aditya Anil, Steve De Roche, Fabio, Trend2816, Brett Carlton, Sanan, James Vincent. How's your tech? My tech is well. I hope your tech is well as well. <laughs> All right, we got we got a bit to talk about, uh, especially uh, this is going to be a little bit more when it comes to the actual gadgets. It's going to be a little bit more uh, leak and rumor heavy, uh, some confirmations on some products coming out. And then I've already gotten a bunch of requests from people shooting comments over on Twitter, uh, some things that we can talk about and uh, and uh, yeah, some politics that we're going to have to cover, too. From Aditya NL only on YouTube, Juan. Only. I would never be on any other platform. Uh, I'll beholden to the YouTubes. Uh, now, there was a story that uh, was making the rounds on Reddit over the weekend. Just a YouTuber talking about how they got burned out by having to deal with YouTube shenanigans. And it's just like another data point in an increasingly long chain of frustrations for online content creators uh, people who are trying to produce their own stuff on the internet because you're often beholden to platforms from major corporations that they have their interests in heart. They don't have your interests in heart. And it's exceedingly difficult to work within certain systems depending on the type of content you're trying to produce. So this was from the uh, perspective of a musician. You know what? If I can find the Reddit link again, it was a comment. It wasn't like some article or a news story that I could directly link to, but I can link to this comment. Um, from a musician, and that he got a, a little bit of a Reddit bump, and his music was starting to do really well on the YouTubes, and then just song after song after song would start getting uh, flagged by Sony for copyright, and he would go through the process of uh, proving that this was an original content, this was original, this was an original creation that he owned all the rights to it, and YouTube would eventually back off the copyright claim. But the next time he'd put out a song, if it got to trending, it, it would get um, it would get hammered again. So the uh, the hypothesis was that just someone at Sony is randomly going through and and creating false DMCA, uh, Digital Millennium Copyright Act uh, violation requests for takedowns, and that YouTube is obviously gonna play ball with Sony and not with this other guy. So after round after round after round of this. His channel got flagged for heavy abuse because he was constantly getting these DMCA violation takedown requests, even though every single one of them was getting returned on appeal. But that this is an automated system and YouTube saw, oh, well, he's getting a lot of takedown requests. This channel must be a problem. And of course, they went after the channel. There is no, apparently, there is no penalty for abusing the DMCA system on YouTube. So that's cool. <laughs> so the, the the short story incredibly long. I don't know why I'm recounting the story like this. Like if I had just read it word for word, it probably would have been shorter than me trying to remember this story. Apologies. Short story long. Um, he eventually just pulled this channel off of YouTube. And, and that's not the situation I'm facing, but I'm definitely facing demonetization of videos. I just got another round of emails from YouTube where videos that I had never had any type of notification that the monetization had been pulled, and as far as I know, still had green dollar signs on YouTube, I just got a round of emails saying, oh, these videos are safe for monetizing again. 
So now I'm even having shadow demonetizations. It's like secret, double secret probate, probate, probation. <laughs> I like. Uh, what, what, what are we really doing here? Um, in in other happier news, uh, last month to this month, um, in the first week of this month. Patreon has has substantially exceeded YouTube monetization, and uh, we're getting really close to unlocking ad-free versions of the podcast, where I'm not going to build in a whole bunch of commercials for the Patreon feed for this podcast, just as I'm getting ready to start a new series that I've been teasing for a really long time, um, talking about uh, creator chats. And so uh, over the weekend, I had a lovely conversation with Mr. TK Bay, and uh, I'm going to edit that out, and I hope to have that out for you guys on Friday. So that's going to be an audio-only podcast. YouTube is being really persnickety. Uh, We did record video. Uh, we, we ended up pulling it through a Skype chat just because Hangouts didn't work very well for TK and Skype's new call recording feature seems to be working all right. Um, but we also recorded higher quality audio. So I'm going to do a high quality audio version. I might put the video out on Patreon. I'm not sure. It's not super great video. So I'm not entirely sure. uh not entirely sure if it's even worth putting that out there. But if there are some requests for it, cool and uh we'll 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 hook it up um yeah if you want to see the video of me and tk talking in a skype call really chill low-key conversation um we do of course we have to talk about a couple phones but most of the conversation is focused on tk's experiences coming up how he got started at xda developers why he decided to start producing on his own channel and then some of the issues that he's faced in trying to cultivate a good audience, you know, what, what it takes to really manage, uh, the conversation in, on this, on these digital platforms. And, uh, you know, his experience is obviously different than mine. And he's a very kind gentleman, whereas I'm way snarkier. So if you want to get a great insight into you know, what, what it might take to do some tech reviewing, then you can take a look there. I'm going to be, uh, I've got three other people lined up over the next week just to do some long form conversations on because I find everyone's story and how they got started in doing some type of creative endeavor. They're not all going to be tech reviewers. Um, I I really also want to start branching this out to writers, to directors, to producers, but then having some of these conversations where you can maybe learn something from another discipline that you might not have if you were only looking at someone who reviews phones or someone who only does PC builds. So that's... uh, that's where I really want to try and drive some of this discussion. And also, like I said, it's uh, like I was going to say, the the stories of how people get started, I find, are often just as interesting as the content they produce. And, you know, that that's always a, an interesting interview. Aditi Anil, are you planning on getting Demir on the interview podcast? I am. I actually reached out to him months ago while I was still doing the Pocket Now podcast and had zero bandwidth. To try and uh, to to try and get another show up off the ground, and now that I finally settled into a pretty decent rhythm between New Egg and my personal channel, I feel like I can dedicate some better space. So uh, the nitpicker, um, I will be reaching out to you again <laughs> to lock down some time to have a conversation. Because again, a, a lot of this isn't. You know, let me just go after who's going to be the most popular, you know, make a video series where I, I put famous YouTubers names in the description bar so that I can get better SEO <laughs> when people search for things. What what I want to do are find people who I think are telling interesting stories and then see if their story is as interesting as the stories they tell. That was a really long winded way of explaining all that. So one thing that I want to do right before we jump into news I did a review on a lamp. Uh, this is this is the last little bit of housekeeping I promised. I did a review on the BenQ light bar. I'm going to pull this up right now. I should have pulled this up before we started. Do, do, do. Um, here we go. And I was kind of surprised. I shouldn't have been. Like, I shouldn't have been surprised by this. I was kind of surprised by the pushback on the price. Oh, I still have my speakers on. That's dumb. <laughs> 
So let me go into just kind of a screen share here. So I was kind of surprised by the pushback on the price. This is a $130 lamp. No one's no one's disputing that this is expensive. But so many people were rushing into my comments saying like, oh, I w totally would have bought this if it was $40. Or I totally would have bought this if it was half the price. And those kinds of comments really bother me. Those kinds of comments bother me because it, it's it's different than just saying like, oh, you know what? This isn't a product for me. This isn't a product that I would enjoy. Or, you know, this this is a little too rich. We have this thing, this sort of tech entitlement, where even though we can't point to something that costs the same, that we can determine what the price value or the price proposition of a product should be, um, again, with no other evidence to support that assertion. So this is a $130 lamp. Throughout the course of this podcast, what I would like you guys to do, because I want to make sure I'm not off base here. Like I gave this a really positive review, and I said in my review that this lamp earns its price. If anyone can find me a dual color tone LED lamp, zero footprint on your desk, so there's it can't take up any space on your desk, and has a built-in light sensor to automatically control the color temperature and the color intensity of the light on your desk, then I'm going to hook you up with something. I don't know what, maybe a Mega Pickle mug. So if, if you can find me a lamp that meets those criteria for under $130, and it can't be the smaller version of the BenQ light bar. So there is a BenQ light bar that retails for 100 and it's smaller and it doesn't have the ambient light sensor built into the same way. So you can't use BenQ's own products against BenQ. But if you can find me that before the end of this podcast, so apologies people who are listening to this, you know, you know the, the post show. This is a, a time sensitive um, contest. Get your Google foo out because you guys are probably better at the Googles than I am. But I want to make sure that I didn't miss the boat on a product that I gave a positive recommendation to because I couldn't find anything quite like it in the market. I was finding Ikea lamps for 50 bucks that didn't even have a light bulb included. So try and find it. See if you can and see if you can build it. No fair if it's, you know, you DIY it. Obviously, if you make your own products and you're not mass producing a product, you can do it cheaper yourself. It probably just won't look as nice unless you put in way more than $130 worth of machining and manufacturing. And if anyone can find me one, I will hook you up with a mega pickle mug by the end of the podcast. So <sighs> From Aditya Anil, did they not see the dope dial attached to it and the engineering skill needed to balance it on a monitor with the sensor inside it? It's worthy of the price tag. So again, I don't want to. I'm, I'm not trying to say that it's not expensive. It is an expensive lamp, but I don't think people realize like what a nice desk fixture goes for. You know, like if you were to go and like outfit. Yeah, look at our politicians. They can spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on a desk. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> if, if they can spend that much on a desk, just imagine how much they can spend on a crappy lamp. <laughs> so that's that's the challenge. I want to start doing like silly random things like this. Like, can you find this? Because I I couldn't. And uh, if anyone can, I would like to reward you for your Googling efforts. Um, so yeah, there's a, there's going to be some other fun stuff. I'll do a little wrap up, uh, housekeeping wrap up, but I want to get into some news now. I'm seeing for Rid Frid. I'm seeing fat produce LS2. I'm seeing, uh, extra cocoa mint. <laughs> extra cocoa mint says, yeah, people who say they would buy it at a lower price are just sour graping. I like that term. I think I'm going to borrow that term from you. Sour graping. I like that because it's been one of the things that always bugs me about phone reviews when a company puts out a product and then immediately there's some whinging on about price before anyone's really had a chance to use it. So my perfect example this year is the LG G7. The LG G7 came out, it was it full retail price, 20 bucks more than the smaller Galaxy S9, but had features that rivaled the Galaxy S9 Plus. It sort of fits in between those two phones. So I think LG earns that $20 premium. But then it also launched on most carriers in the United States at a BOGO. So you would get two for the price of one. Um, 
that that kind of oh I would totally have bought the Galaxy uh, the LG G7 if it were half the price. The only th- way that LG could ever get my money is if it were half the price of the product I'm already using. But then we all know that that's not true. So you know we're all brand whores to some degree, and that notion of well I, I would totally stray from the manufacturer that I really enjoy and the label that you know identifies me as a savvy tech consumer if I just had a cheaper product. That's not a thing. That doesn't happen. I'm not sitting there going like, well, this is the phone that I really enjoy. Oh, a phone has totally different specs and a totally different vibe, but it's half the price. I should buy that one. So nah, that's that 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 that's not a thing. I really like that sour graping. Um I'm 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 totally gonna start working that into reviews and I may or may not credit you. I should credit you. Yeah, I'll credit you. Okay, so anyway. <laughs> All right, we, we got to chew through some news. I promise you I do not want to spend an hour and a half talking about this news from this week. Some of it was uh, totes legit depressing. Um, let me get this queued up here. So a little ray of sunshine in an otherwise terrible piece of news. We've got, this is by way of Ars Technica, Verizon lobbyist runs for the New York attorney general seat as the state sues FCC over net neutrality repeal. Uh, Alicia Eve would recuse herself from Verizon matters and the net neutrality case. So why is she running? This is like the biggest issue facing New York right now as they're trying to follow in California's footsteps to get their net neutrality bill up off the ground. But I digress. So this is from the article of Verizon lobbyist is trying to become the attorney general of New York in the upcoming November election. Verizon executive Leisha Eve is one of four candidates in the Democratic primary for the seat vacated when Eric Schneiderman resigned after assault allegations from four women. If elected, Eve says she would recuse herself from Verizon matters and New York State's appeal of the federal net neutrality repeal or or New York State's appeal of the federal net neutrality repeal. Uh, I believe this is a quote from Eve's bio on her campaign site. As vice president for government affairs for Verizon for New York. That's a great title. Um, Oh, wait, no. As vice president for government affairs for Verizon for New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut, Leisha oversees policy and ensures governmental compliance for a company that innovates and invests billions in New York State and puts nearly 20,000 New Yorkers to work every day. That's great. But the attorney general is not a position that deals directly in job growth or job loss. Regardless, I don't want to immediately call into question someone's credentials in the telecommunications space and automatically say that they are compromised or they're a bad fit for the job just because we can point to someone like Ajit Pai at the FCC who is obviously dismantling what the FCC's uh, core tenants are or or what the the core job function of the FCC is uh, in favor of supporting corporate policy and not acting as the the regulatory agency that it should. Um, we, We had similar concerns when Tom Wheeler uh, was appointed head of the uh, chair of the FCC because he had a background uh, working for telecommunications industries and uh, as a telecom lobbyist. And he turned out to be a pretty even handed, a pretty fair um, protector of the regulatory actions of the FCC and was behind most of the initiative to get uh, the open internet order uh, passed during the Obama administration. So I don't want to say that Ms. Eve is automatically compromised. But here's one of the problems I have with her mounting this campaign right now is New York's biggest actions in the telecommunications space, that things that the attorney general should be in charge of overseeing, major cases have to do with this appeal, appealing the repeal of net neutrality, and also how telecoms do business in the state of New York. So if she recuses herself from two significant actions in that space, 
why should we vote for her? She cannot be effective in her job role if she can't oversee some of the biggest actions facing New York State. Incredibly frustrating. But the little ray of sunshine here is that she's cur currently polling last of the four candidates. So it's not likely that she's going to pick up a tremendous amount of steam. But even during this campaign, what will be disappointing is if she's able to leverage her campaign in a way to continue spreading misinformation about net neutrality protections and the relationship between telecoms. Already, her bio on her campaign site is talking about jobs from Verizon, which, again, not, not something that is incredibly important to the discussion of an attorney general. So I really feel like these types of moves where she's being put up probably by some kind of corporate fund uh, are, are basically just hedging PR battles to, to try and keep messaging out there as we know New York is going through this this move to try and uh, reinstate net neutrality or d several moves to try and reinstate net neutrality. I, I really do hope that New York State is able to get a bill off the ground that looks like California's SB 822. So we'll see. Um, get this out of the way here. Okay, next, quick story. From the, he's not wrong, but he's still a jerk uh, file. This is by way of The Verge. Um, FCC chairman says Twitter, Facebook, Google may need transparency law. Hmm. The leader of the Federal Communications Commission says that major web companies like Facebook, Twitter, and Google have offered little transparency into how they work, and it's time to seriously consider forcing them to tell us. Hmm. In a blog post today, FCC Chairman Ajit Pai calls out a long list of algorithmic and moderation decisions by web companies, including Twitter, choosing not to ban New York Times columnist Sarah Jung, a former Verge writer, and says that consumers have virtually no insight into how or why they happen. The same goes for privacy issues around how and where our data is used. Quote, the public deserves to know more about how these companies operate, and we need to seriously think about whether the time has come for these companies to abide by new transparency obligations. So here's what's frustrating. And Extra Coco Mint, totally with you. He says, I'm not even American, but that Ajit guy pisses me off. <laughs> and Steve Desrochers, oh, Sarah Zhang. Here's the thing. Ajit Pai is not incorrect. I agree with the sentiment, the kernel of truth, that there should be some kind of regulatory action facing major tech companies. They are completely off the reservation. There is no reigning in their business practices. They are monster industries that are making themselves too big to fail and have started to supplant the core services that they operate on. And I mean by that, like, for a number of your family and friends, Facebook might as well be the internet, right? Um, a company like Reddit might as well be, you know, I, not to out her, but, you know, I was talking to my wife yesterday and there was just a whole bunch of really sour news and tons of really angry comments on stories that she cared about. And the more I started looking into her browsing habits, the more I thought, you need to take a Reddit vacation and then just maybe fire up an RSS feed reader. Go directly to the articles that you're reading through Reddit. Go directly to those blogs, to those news sites, as opposed to going through the headline on Reddit, going through the comments on Reddit, and that's the lens by which you're viewing the story because it can get really toxic if you dive in too deep, right? So when you have so many companies that exist on top of the actual framework that filter, that moderate, that algorithmically alter the content that you're, you're supposed to view, and, and why I don't think it's fair anymore. You know, a Facebook can claim that they're just some sort of distribution engine, but they make editorial decisions as to what content you can view. Same thing. We were just complaining about YouTube. YouTube manipulates your subscription feed. They manipulate which channels you actually get notified by. So they are making an editorial decision as to the quality and uh, uh, the amount of content that you view. And they're doing it to try and keep you invested in the site as much as you can while still maintaining some kind of advertiser-friendly platform that people that, that corporations want to give them money to run ads on. So... That's 
the same thing as a newspaper. They should be held to the same standards that we hold, <laughs> the same almost non-existent standards that we hold news agencies to, right? If they're going to to try and have it both ways, we've got a problem there. So I don't disagree with the sentiment that there probably does need to be some regulatory corrective action before a Google is just so big that any type of restriction to Google would harm users on the internet. We, we need to start reining in some of the power and reach of these mega corporations. What's frustrating is that this is a completely disingenuous stance from someone who has no interest in protecting consumers or protecting the population, protecting citizens, and that the FCC has completely abdicated its role in any kind of regulatory action against the corporations that really provide you access to the internet, but now he wants to go after services on the internet. This is a far cry from what the FCC should be involved in, and if I'm following in the footsteps of my conservative brethren, when we look at some of the companies on the internet, this is one of those instances where I feel like the FTC should be getting involved. They love saying the FTC should be in charge of regulating the internet, but I also feel that they should be involved in this conversation of regulating companies who do business on the internet. So that that is um, th that that is a completely frustrating. Again, yet another data point that the hypocrisy of this current administration, as it pertains to technology law, is suffocatingly smug. And uh, anything we can do to start pushing back against this, because it really does feel just kind of punitive. These are companies that say mean things, and people say mean things about me on the internet. And uh, even though we've got some great evidence, which we're going to talk about here in just a second, that net neutrality, get, gutting net neutrality does actually harm consumers. I don't want people to say mean things about me, and they say mean things about me on Reddit and Facebook. So we need to regulate Reddit and Facebook, but we can't regulate Verizon. Um, that was about as close to a, to a, an agit pie impression as I'd be able to get. So we'll see. <laughs> for it, for it. In a few years, there's going to be a documentary on this issue. Can't wait. I love these things. <laughs> <laughs> from tech leathercraft i'm wondering how 5g will impact this stuff technically still being run by three to four isp providers I, I i really i'm getting to that point where i'm super super anxious and super nervous that 5g is really just gonna be another marketing buzz term and that we we're probably 10 years out from seeing substantive improvements to our networks built off of 5G technologies. I really think we're going to see this mad rush to try and eat up more air, eat up more spectrum, but not do anything to improve stuff like backhaul. Um, and then you end up with Again, it's the same metaphor that I've used before. Like the initial rollout for 5G is basically going to be like putting an amazing new gaming router on the same old BS uh, data connection that you've always had. So, you know, like you've got a, a, a one megabit DSL line, but you've got a 10 gigabit gaming router. Ugh. Well, you don't get faster internet. <laughs> You still have a one megabit connection, and 5G is going to be the same. We're going to have all these amazing micro micro signal 5G towers, you know, going up for amazing building penetration, even though it won't because this is like super high frequency stuff. And then you're still going to connect to the exact same, like, oh, I can kind of get a 15 megabit download. Neat. So I, I'm I'm not I'm not super impressed. Uh, from Brett Carlton, want to get a voice in government. We need to vote for the right politicians and vote out as many people as possible in November. Can't control everything, but they can start to make inroads. We'll be, I'll be really curious to see. I, I, I've been listening to politics uh, podcasts, and a lot of them are talking about this blue wave that's supposed to come in November for the midterms. And uh, I, we've seen some some interesting reversals in, uh, in some of the... Um, recent elections, uh, 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 some of these runoff elections. So there's potential there, but people are talking about it like it's going to be a weather phenomenon. And that always makes me nervous because that depends on people actually getting out and voting. And that also depends on enough people voting in gerrymandered districts to overcome gerrymandering. 
and those are also pretty big gets. So I do not put it as a foregone conclusion. There is statistically a very high likelihood that the Democrats will not take back the Senate or the House. So if people aren't actually motivated or actually activated on these issues, then we won't see any actual change. But this net neutrality is, again, the perfect data point to hold up that both parties are not the same. That this is, you know, there are substantial issues that I have with the Democratic Party as an actual committee of individuals who run the sort of left-leaning side of our political machine. Humongous. But under a Democratic administration, we had just the last bit of momentum we needed to push through net neutrality. And as soon as we uh, installed a conservative uh, GOP presidential administration, we saw machinery to dismantle it. That is a very clear example of how government is still beholden to voters, right? You voted for liberals, they put in net neutrality. You voted for conservatives, they took it away. Corporations will never respond to the populace. Corporations are only beholden to shareholders. So there are so many things that the free market will do better than government. But when it comes to instituting policy like net neutrality, then we actually do need to turn to government as a solution for that stuff. Um, from DVZN Media, I think talking about 5G, the problem with these terms is not that there isn't real tech behind them. It's just that companies latch them onto faulty tech that is somewhat based on the idea, like AI. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of the, in a very, in a very short form way, that, that's sort of what I was pointing at, is when 4G came out, we had a whole bunch of different 4G speeds, right? You know, like, so uh, AT&T would put out, oh, our, our phones have 4G speeds, but it wasn't actually LTE. And also, when we first started firing up LTE radios, they were mostly in markets that could support some additional backhaul. But LTE throughout most of this country, especially in more rural areas, is only just slightly bettering some of the speeds that we were already getting on HSPA. Like when I'm out in visiting family in New Mexico and we have to drive through rural New Mexico, I have four or five bars of LTE, but the actual download rate is substantially slower than what LTE should be as any type of broadband indicator. And it's very similar to when I was on T-Mobile's HSPA way back in the day. So it's like 3G plus speeds with an LTE data connection. It's, it's all just marketing. Uh, um, from Chaos5338, Juan, what do you see as a good example of AI in phones? That's a very good question. Um, so I think one of the most interesting examples of AI in phones is obviously some of the work that's being done in the camera space. So it's making auto modes, uh, more intelligent so that the phone can scan what's in the scene and then make a decision on the exposure and the post-production of that photo based on other examples that have been, that have proven popular in social media. I think that's a really interesting visible application. But the thing that I hope we'll actually see more of is AI helping in spaces like augmented reality for things like translation. Microsoft's Translator app, as it plugs into these new neural cores like Huawei's MPU and the uh, Qualcomm 845's AI core, I forget what their actual terminology for that is, taking things to be analyzed more on the device frees up network traffic, and should hopefully benefit security. So it, it is kind of shocking when you go through your Google history and you get that bucket of info. You request that bucket of info that Google has on you for every single search, every single query, and every single voice action that you've performed. I feel like that could be a compromising point. Not necessarily someone's going to go in there and hack Google's mainframe, but if someone wanted to mess with you, the social engineering of hacking your personal information, not as substantial as hacking Google servers, and they would have access to an incredible amount of very personal information. 
So as much as we can keep pulling that back to be analyzed and processed on device, that'll be a huge step, in my opinion. And one of those AI as auto as a copilot type usages, which isn't super sexy. That's not sexy at all. People aren't going to be impressed by that. But hopefully we can make it seamless so that they don't even know that it's really happened, that they don't know that anything's changed or that some things might have gotten better, where if you're trying to do these type of voice transcription, voice search type of uh, queries and the analysis is being done on device, then maybe that'll be faster if you're in a poor data area. So that to me would be one of the potential um, benefits, major benefits of AI to start, um, especially with the hardware that we currently have. Um, there was a lot of chatter about net neutrality and people trying to say free market. And I, I, it's a little difficult to untangle who is saying what in the live chat. So I'm just going to move on because I'm pretty sure that everyone just sort of agrees with me that uh, light touch regulatory reactions like net neutrality are the best way forward for some kind of consumer protections and that uh, there is literally zero data to support the opposite of a free market approach as we've gutted net neutrality. And that brings us to our next story, where, again, it didn't get a ton of traffic um, outside of just the initial push of, oh, no, this thing happened. So uh, lots of outlets have covered this. I, uh, the first one I pulled up this morning was from Bloomberg. YouTube, Netflix videos found to be slowed by wireless carriers. And this is from the article. Uh, the largest U.S. telecom companies are slowing internet traffic to and from popular apps like YouTube and Netflix, according to new research from Northeastern University and the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Researchers used a smartphone app called Weehee, downloaded by about 100,000 consumers, to monitor which mobile services are being throttled when and by whom in what likely is the single largest running study of its kind. Among U.S. wireless carriers, YouTube is the number one target of throttling where data speeds are slowed, according to the data. Netflix, uh, Netflix Inc.'s video streaming service, Amazon Inc.'s Prime Video, and the NBC Sports app have been degraded in similar ways. According to David Chofnes, Chofney, uh, one of the study authors who developed the Weehee app, uh, from January through early May, the app detected differentiation by Verizon Communications more than 11,100 times. Uh, according to the study, this is when a type of traffic on a network is treated differently than other types. Most of this activity is throttling. Let me get that back to right there. So I don't think we should be overly surprised by this study examining mobile video. Because even when we were... In that brief window, remember the OIO, the Open Internet Order, was only passed um, and installed for about a year. So most of the major tenets of net neutrality were never really fully enacted. Um, we were going through those, if you remember, we were going through those debates. Things like T-Mobile's Bin John is a very consumer-friendly uh, service. You know, you can stream all of the music from these these music apps that you want. You can stream all of the video from these video apps that you want. Um, but that means you are agreeing to T-Mobile's uh, winners and losers. You know, what services there that you're allowed to stream and what quality you're allowed to stream at. So while that's consumer friendly, it doesn't count against your data. It's not very net neutrality friendly because it is one corporation installing barriers and limits on some services and not on others. So we were still untang and untangling all of the legal ramifications of the various streaming services where a Verizon will automatically downgrade video. AT&T will automatically downgrade video. And that's part of what you sign up for in the fine print on these new unlimited plans. Remember, we have them advertising unlimited data, but what they mean is you have unlimited 2G data speeds. That's what you get. You have a certain bucket of high-speed LTE, and if you cross that bucket, you'll be, you'll be reined in. There's that threshold. There's that cap. So in, a, in addition to that, because you have unlimited data, huh, huh, 
in that fine print, they also have policy where they're allowed to control, augment, or degrade individual services. But where this is frustrating, the major carriers, whenever they're sort of pinned on these subjects, they like to talk about how Verizon as a network doesn't look at the quality of data. They're, they're not throttling based on individual services. They're throttling based on these general trends to free up networks so that they can avoid network congestion. But it seems, especially once we start getting into the granular analysis of what gets throttled and what doesn't, that very specific usage is being targeted. And this is what this is what we were all pointing to as the lobster pot effect for net neutrality. Net neutrality gets gutted after Ajit Pai just rams through this on very specious arguments that were later proved to be complete fabrications, claimed that they were getting denial of service attacks, even though they really weren't. They were the ones who started the conspiracy theory about the DDoS attacks, and then none of them have been held responsible for outright misrepresenting what happened to the FCC's website during comments. They used those denial of service attack claims to invalidate uh, citizens' opinions on net neutrality, and then we get to this point where net neutrality gets gutted, and the day after, we've got a whole ton of conservatives going, well, see, the internet still works, I can still buy things on the internet, I can still stream video, net neutrality wasn't necessary, and a couple months later, now we're starting to see the impact. Verizon has three unlimited plans that none of them are really unlimited for high-speed data. Why do you need three different tiers of unlimited? <laughs> Why? Why is that a thing? And at the same time, we're also talking about um, prioritization of some services, degradation of other services. And it's super subtle. You can still stream. I, I mean, I, I streamed uh, Word Party for my daughter on LTE uh, just, uh, just a couple days ago. And it worked quality didn't ever make it to that high tier but it worked she was still able to watch her fun little jim henson animated show where they sing songs and learn lessons it still worked but increasingly those types of services are going to be targeted while at&t works out deals verizon works out deals t-mobile works out deals that they can they can get paid better for other services so it's going to continue this this problem is going to continue to get worse that's what the lobster pot effect is. A little change here, you're not going to rally in the streets. A little change there. Oh, you know what? I can live with that. A, a, a little tweak to this service. Well, I don't even use that service, so why should I be concerned? And before you know it, the internet sucks. <laughs> so this is, again, another data point where if you care about actual free market and you, act, you, you care about real competition and you want to make sure that this is a fair and even playing field and that the services who control the pipes to the internet can't control what you watch on the internet, then you need to get out there and vote. And I, there's a very specific party which has overwhelmingly supported net neutrality, and there's a very specific party who, despite a majority of conservatives supporting net neutrality, keeps trying to gut your ability to get around uh, carriers. So... Steve Desroche, we don't have unlimited data in Canada, at least with unlimited star, we would have a peace of mind to never go over the data plan and rake an obscene amount of fees. So Steve, there, there is also, I think, um, I think there is also still a good faith argument for a certain tier um, of performance. So I look at something like, like Project Phi, and uh, my wife is now on Project Phi. Uh, she, she just didn't want to keep doing business with the carrier we were on before. Uh, and there, there was something really interesting about just sort of a meter, but a fair meter, where um, her usage really did have an impact on how much the bill would climb, and then also getting discounts on when she didn't use as much data. And I think that could be something of benefit too. But I really hope that Canadian politicians will start to get behind some of these initiatives too because right now in the United States we just have a very disingenuous conversation about what your 
your usage and your bill really resembles. So some people are going to grossly overpay for service they don't really need. And some people have actual needs for a substantial amount of use on a, on a mobile network. And we want to acknowledge that there is a finite amount of bandwidth and traffic that can be pushed through these servers at any given time. Um, so if we, if we could have a grown-up conversation about that, maybe we would stop using these unlimited terms and come up with uh, fee and rate structures that are clear and easily understood and you don't have a ton of stuff buried in fine print that would change your behavior if you knew it even existed that's the kind of thing that is really galling about this where they're trying to they're winning the pr battle on terminology oh i have unlimited data so i don't care about these things and uh, i'm not going to get throttled until i hit 20 gig anyway but then maybe they only use like a gig of data a month so they really should be on some type of project fi style billing structure. I just don't want to have to worry about it. You're like, well, yeah, but you're spending 80 bucks a month when you could be spending 30. <laughs> so you're, you're not doing any better there, man. Come on. Um, from Doc Yagamikikyo. Sorry, I just butchered your name. Why not fix the congestion instead of avoiding avoiding it via data caps. And we've actually talked about that on previous episodes of this podcast, uh, Doc Yaga, where the telecom, telecom industry is holding back on network improvements until they get more public funds because the internet is like a utility according to all of the major telecoms and the lobbying arms of all the major telecoms. So free market has already failed according to them. Free market policy does not work because the internet is like electricity. It's as vital as electricity and water. So they need, they won't, they won't fix anything until they get more tax dollars and they get more uh, sweetheart deals and they get more zoning breaks and they get, uh, you know, more uh, infrastructure from the American people. But they don't want any regulations. They don't want to have to deal with a net neutrality style regulation. So... Oh, Tech Leathercraft, thank you so much for the super chat. Deeper level of tech conversation really lacking on YT lately. Thanks, Juan, for these live streams. I, I'm not going to say thank me. I'm going to say thank all of you wonderful people in the chat because I know, I know for a fact that a lot of you disagree with me. I know for a fact that a lot of you, uh, especially my, my viewers who are more libertarian leaning and uh, more right wing leaning, completely disagree with me on a number of these topics. And I want to thank you for joining this conversation in earnest because I've been muting a whole bunch of people and I still get semi-regular death threats on this channel regarding some of the, uh, some of the positions I've taken on these topics that um, I really do feel in my heart that the soul of the United States is the proper fight is between the social Democrats and the libertarians because I think both are aspirational. And somewhere in the middle, we could work out a compromise that would be the absolute best fit for the American people. But I don't believe we can get there with the current entrenched GOP um, sort of manipulated by very, very staunch corporate interests. And I don't think we can get there with Democrats who don't seem to be particularly imaginative <laughs> in how they're trying to craft policy. So that that's where I think this conversation is most interesting. Um, I, I mean, I'm still going to be snarky about my stance for net neutrality because I still have not seen any evidence to suggest that not having net neutrality would be better until we can get to a place where free market actually can operate. Um, but that's that's the game. So if it weren't for that level of discussion in these comments, I don't think we'd be able to have a podcast that can dig into some of these deeper topics in any meaningful fashion. From Ronald Sims, I'm looking into Project Five, but I need a better job and to free up some debt. <laughs> yeah, I mean, anytime you want to change on something like that, definitely make sure your finances are in order. Um, <laughs> from Aditya Anil, new YouTube terms and conditions. Occasional death threats are part of the the, the YouTube experience. What the heck? That that's not on YouTube. I, I mean, I I got my first death threat from a Samsung fan because I wasn't paying Samsung enough uh, respect. Uh, by being critical, this was around the Note 5. Uh, and then I got a, my second death threat from a Canon fan after I did a Samsung uh, ditch the DSLR event where I showed people dropping uh, DSLRs uh, into a bin 
um, to get new Samsung cameras. And that really pissed off a lot of people, um, I believe, whose native languages were likely Japanese. And then from there, as I've started delving into tech and politics, the second I put politics into anything, it's uh, I, 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 I'm sure a component of this is also just like Russian bots and brigading and stuff. But it also means that my channel is going to continue to get demonetized because YouTube doesn't like it when you touch on anything which might be sensitive. So um, let's move on. You know what? I'm going to skip this story. I'm going to link it in the chat below, but we've already spent a lot of time talking about cranky political stuff. So let me just blitz through these real quick. And uh, apologies, I know we're going to... Um, uh, <laughs> from Rick Bearcat, well, clearly you need to stop covering Samsung phones in events. <laughs> All right, so Rick Bearcat, that... Let me let me just l let me just kind of clear the air on something. I uh, I posted a, a very lengthy uh, explanation of the current state of this channel on Patreon, and uh, we I got into the the particulars of what it was that I was working on, my relationship with certain companies PR, and I asked my Patreon audience in earnest. Uh, you know, what should we do for covering the phones coming into the end of 2018? And it looks like unless I can get some kind of loner, I will not review anything Samsung this year outside of my retrospective on the Galaxy Note 4. Uh, where I was trying to work for some type of loner unit or review unit, um, I've been ghosted. Uh, by a PR company that I've worked with very closely in terms of covering television. Um, and I kind of feel like if I were to get a Note 9 today, like if I were to get one this minute, I would, I would put in a substantial amount of work on a product that has already been talked to death that not a lot of people would have particular insights on outside of my audio and camera tests, which would be Patreon exclusives anyway. And... I'm trying to gear up. In two days, we're going to have an Apple event. We're going to have a Pixel event. We're going to have an LG V40. We're going to have a OnePlus 6T. We're going to have a Mate 20. And these are the phones that are really driving, in my opinion, more interesting discussions um, long term. So, again, I'm not completely writing off the note. I might still pick one up at some point uh, just to do some light testing. But uh, it, it's it's pretty clear to me now that there isn't a ton of pressure on additional commentary for the note. I'm, I'm looking at videos going up th th over the weekend and today where major outlets are putting in a ton of time and effort to make high quality videos for the note. And they're getting like 10,000 views, 5,000 views, uh, long-term review note nine, 3000 views. Like this isn't something that I can afford. One, I can't afford to spend $1,000 on a phone that I'm not going to use as my own daily driver. So that's already part of the review, too. Um, um, but then I, you know, it would take me a week to do a Note 9 camera review. It would take me two days to finish up a, a Note 9 audio review. So 10 days of work, and I know I'm not going to get traffic out of that. Especially with YouTube demonetizing and delisting my videos, it just it, it 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 can't work. From Brett Carlton, oh well, Samsung is overrated. <laughs> You're better than that. Everyone raves about Samsung phones. You don't have to waste time reviewing them. Camera is unicorn barf anyway. Um, Aditya Anil, nah, one one plus six T, Pixel three, and iPhone will probably yield better SEO. Alan Lange, Samsung isn't worth spending time on. I personally don't want a phone with a skin any longer, so Google Pixel or I will move to an iPhone. From Doc Yaga, LG V40 FTW. Um, from Steve De Roche, come on, Juan, you will never get to the Reddit's front page with no Samsung coverage. Steve, I've done tons of Samsung coverage. I've no one shares my videos on Reddit. I, like you know, I've been sort of delisted off of a bunch of subreddits. I mean, my username has, and I had to kill one of my old uh, Reddit account because I would post my own stuff, and that's, like, major no-no. So if no one's going to support that, why would I continue to try and game Reddit's metrics when people don't help? <laughs> Whereas I have a Patreon audience that is contributing directly, is having phenomenal conversations, is, is uh, much more encouraging, and is actually helping in the strategy 
of producing this stuff. Samsung is not a foregone conclusion. Apple is not a foregone conclusion. And I'm tired of holding up specific companies to some sort of lofty ideal or lofty standard when they won't really be the best fit for an individual consumer. But we've all just sort of accepted that they're the high watermark, right? Like they get to be the winners just because they've been the winners. So they get to be the winners. And that's where maybe my time is better spent not trying to chase imaginary YouTube points and imaginary YouTube views, which don't help me at all. They don't monetize at all. They don't build any type of of, uh, compensation at all. This is not a career like it used to be. Again, when I had 20,000 subscribers, I used to make rent off of YouTube. Now I've got 75,000 subscribers and Patreon blows it out of the water with 200 patrons. So why? why? Why play this game of trying to chase SEO when Google goes out of their way to delist and demonetize my videos with no notification? I, I, I don't want to be YouTube popular. I want to be able to feed my daughter. <laughs> uh, so, um, and if anything changes there, like I said, I'm not completely... The, the post that I put on, on, on Patreon sort of detailed the fact that I also took a gamble. I took a gamble and I lost. My big Samsung coverage for 2018 was going to be on my absolute favorite Galaxy phone, the phone that I was going to use as my daily driver, the phone I was going to hold up as an example of everything that was wrong with the current smartphone zeitgeist. The Galaxy S9 Active would have been the perfect device would have had not a glass back, still would have had wireless charging, still would have had a baller camera, would have had the flat screen, no curved size, and it would have had one of the biggest batteries on any Galaxy phone with the smaller Galaxy S9 screen. That phone, I had already planned a month's worth of coverage on that phone. I was going to take it out into the hill, the Hollywood Hills to show dusty, rocky hiking with a phone without having to put it in a case. I was going to take it to a water park to show, you know, the not just lots of phones have water resistance, but way easier to hold on to a phone that's water resistant when it doesn't have a glass back. I was going to do a series of comparisons and then a retrospective on all of the Galaxy Actives in my collection. The only problem with my plan was that the Galaxy S9 Active never existed. (laughs) Absolutely the perfect phone, would have been amazing. That's what I would have done my camera tests on, my audio tests on, except for that small detail that it never existed. So that pushed me out of Galaxy S9 coverage, and then the Note just didn't seem to be something I wanted to try and get for myself i I like previous notes s pen is cool i really like s pen but the thousand dollar phone for what that what the benefit for me would have been just doesn't make sense so i reached out to samsung pr and they said they said yeah cool we love working with you and then i never heard back from them ever again so that's um that's a major bummer (laughs) <laughs> Brett Carlton, Juan, no food for you. Please the masses at the expense of everything. That's how you get on YouTube's radar. <laughs> I'm just like so old and cranky. Like, I'm not going to jump through hoops. I'm not going to sit here and try and untangle what YouTube wants me to do on this channel. Instead, I think I'm just going to keep focusing on the stuff I want to talk about. And you know, the tease for coming up is I've got more audio kit. That's going to be a lot of fun. So anyway, uh, moving right along. Um, This was, uh, I got distracted here. I'm not going to talk about this. I'm going to link it though. Um, Another politics story. After nabbing billions in tax breaks, AT&T's promised job growth magically evaporates. And uh, it was just another tech data point for certain types of policy initiatives. Not really good for the American people. Really awesome for mega corporations. And we shouldn't trust campaign promises on this type of stuff. So there were a whole bunch of promises that you'd give corporations a ton of money and then they would like make more jobs and give better benefits and pay better. And instead we're still looking at job losses in the United States, jobs being shipped overseas. And the bonuses that AT&T was talking about 
were already negotiated before the tax bill was in place. So they claimed that those benefits and those bonuses were a part of this tax break when that had nothing to do with that. So it, it, it's super frustrating. Um, oh, I saw another comment in there. I can't. Oh, someone asking about cat phones. Hmm. <laughs> From chaos five three three eight. Juan needs to start adding arrows and shocked faces to his thumbnails. That's how you get the YouTube money. All right, moving right along. Um, there, there were just a a couple. Um, I don't know. Do we want to talk about Alex Jones? I. I've already gotten so cranky about different um, political topics. We've we've already gone an hour. I don't know. Do we just want to get to the tech, get to some of the rumors and stuff? Anyone in the live chat? So Daniel Ramos, will you get the Note Nine if the price drops? No, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna buy a Note Nine. Steve Desrochers, keep the Alex Jones stuff short. The, the, the reason why is that there were two stories here that I wanted to juxtapose about Apple's App Store immediately. So obviously, Alex Jones got deplatformed from Twitter. Uh, Alex Jones can attack individuals on Twitter, but when he started talking crap about Twitter directly, then he got deplatformed from Twitter. So no, uh, I, I, I don't think Twitter is consistent in their application of their own policy. But... I wanted to show this off back to back. So the app, Apple just permanently banned InfoWars from, from the App Store. So after pulling uh, the InfoWars podcast off of iTunes, now if the, you know Alex Jones wanted to, you could have made an app, or he, I think he had an app, and you could get your stuff through the Alex Jones InfoWars app. You just pulled that off. I guess great if that's Apple's terms of service. They are a private company. I still don't know that completely deplatforming Alex Jones is the best way to curb this speech because I feel it's just going to push him even further underground and reinforce why people who believe him um, believe him. That there's some sort of global cadre conspiracy of trying to silence pure, decent conservative speech, even though he doesn't reflect any of the conservatives that I know. But the reason why I wanted to juxtapose this is because it was sort of a good news, bad news part on Apple this year, where this is from 9to5Mac. The number one paid utility in the Mac app store steals browser history and sends it to Chinese servers. So even in a walled garden, um, we still have issues with, uh, with these kinds of problems. So from this morning, Apple has pulled Adware Doctor. If you're using Adware Doctor anti-malware and ad, uh, adware, adware blocker, then your private information was being zipped up under a loosely password-protected zip file and sent off to a server in China. So, uh, and this was an app that tried to get listed under a bunch of different names. Um, hold on, I'm trying to find, I'm trying to find where they listed this. 9to5Mac actually had like the whole list. So the app originally posed as Adware Medic, an app owned by Malwarebytes, and that led Apple to pull it. But then when they changed the name, Apple allowed it back into the App Store. And then from there, it would hijack your data, zip it up, and send it to another server. And it was the number one utility, the number one paid utility. Five bucks, you paid to have your personal info sent to another server. Win some, lose some. <laughs> it, it's it's the, the, the frustration of, I don't believe you have better security in a completely locked and closed system. We went through some some recent conversations talking about Fortnite. You know, Fortnite decided not to, to put, um, uh, was it Epic Games decided not to put Fortnite on Google Play. And they made a big dumb mistake where their installer for the game could potentially be used to inject malware. And Google called them out on it and called them out on it in a way which was, uh, wasn't was very gentlemanly. Like tech companies kind of have an understanding where if you find a security exploit, you contact the company first to see that they can plug the exploit, fix the problem before shining a huge light on it because then it makes it easier for bad actors to actually utilize that exploit. So Google alerts to them, alerts them saying, hey, there's a big problem here. And they're like, hey, cool. Can you give us like 
I don't know, like a month. And then Google, like two days later, went, hey, guys, look, there's a big problem with Fortnite over there. They didn't use Google Play. And um, not a, not the best look for Google because it's not like Google has ever not had problems with you know malware in the Google Play Store. So just kind of frustrating turn of events. I really do think that there should be more competition in where you can get your data and services from. I really wish there was a, a proper Steam store supporting mobile apps. Um, I, I use Humble Bundle, and I have a Humble Bundle app on my phone, and the games I get through Humble Bundle are updated through the Humble service, and they're responsible for making sure that I don't get terrible malware. Um, those, those types of situations, I feel, actually improve because then it shines a light on, you know, sunlight is the best disinfectant. So we'll see. Um, from Wilson Dang, what photography camera should I get for a beginner? I use my LG V30 manual camera. Wilson, I'm going to table that. Shoot me a message offline. We can talk about cameras. Um, <laughs> oh, Gansey Tech Nerd. Frustrations of being a filmmaker, not tuning in to the live stream on time. That's okay, because Gansey, I'm through all of the cranky news. Let's actually talk about some of the fun new rumors coming out. And I also want to take um, a quick look at some of the other, uh, just share some thoughts. I I'm debating whether or not I even want to do a full video on this, because a number of articles have already kind of summed up my experiences on uh, Android, Android Pie. So I have my OnePlus 6. I, uh, I, I am running the Android Pie. Actually, let me switch it back. I'm running the Android Pie beta um, developer preview. I don't know exactly what are we, what are we calling it. Um, I've already forgotten. So here, let me get this navigation, bar and gestures, navigation gestures with the back home button. Okay. So there... Uh, that's really bright. Let me let me turn that down. Apologies to people listening to this podcast because I'm, I'm trying to show stuff on camera. <laughs> it's riveting audio podcasting right now. So um, one plus six, Android Pie. First off, I have to deliver um, a major thumbs up, major kudos to one plus. This is a really smooth and sleek beta. Um, performance has been phenomenal. Uh, stability has been great. I only spent one day with my SIM card back in the phone, but I didn't have anything that I that worried me with any kind of uh, potential uh, performance issues or networking issues. I know some people have been complaining about stability there. I have not experienced anything, but I've also only used it for a limited time as an actual networked phone, I mean, aside from Wi-Fi. And the only issues that I've had with app stability are on apps that were already a little flaky. So, for example, uh, Marvel Future Fight. I'm still kind of playing that game uh, just for some of the uh, community features. Uh, my guild is really fun to do some of the alliance battles with. But on a uh, like on on Oreo we would still suffer occasional crashes on the more alliance heavy battle modes those are a little more frequent on android pi but that was already an app that was a bit inconsistent and a bit unstable on android oreo so i'm not laying that on the feet of of this as a developer preview and i haven't run into many other substantial issues on the six the one plus six um I do like the new layout, the circular, uh, the the animations and the circular layout for this. Uh, the the panel uh, preview. It feels like we've kind of fully realized the Palm Pre in terms of multitasking. <laughs> like so many, so much of this, like what makes Android feel modern. I kind of keep looking back at the Palm, you know, like yeah, we had that. <laughs> Sliding gestures, uh, panels, cards. Yeah, we we we've been doing that for a while. Um, uh, from uh, Gansey Tech Nerd, Brandon Miniman made a video on this. Uh, One plus six Android Pi beta is smooth and stable. Is the verdict? Do you think mileage varies for each user depending on the apps installed? Absolutely. Like I was saying, if you're if you were using an app on Oreo that was a little unstable, it will be more unstable in Android Pi. There are just some things that haven't really been fully corrected for, and that requires the app developer to fix, not Google, not the manufacturer. But it did. I did want to bring up one of the reasons why I was considering doing a video on um, on Android Pie 
as a preview. I don't think I like this semi gesture setup that OnePlus is is implemented here. So OnePlus has their own unique gestures for navigation. And then we've got this little pill of a home button and a swipe to bring up your multitasking cards. I don't think I like gestures for that. The deliberate action of pulling from the bottom of the screen as opposed to tapping the little square icon requires more muscle movement, requires more focus and dedication to that movement. And that means that there's a greater likelihood that that will, you, you might miss the gesture, right? You might, you might miss it, which if you swipe up, just sort of from the apps, you get your app tray. And that I like because I've been using that on Nova Launcher for a while now. Instead of having an app drawer button, you swipe up for your apps. But our phones are getting so tall and so skinny that anything that requires me to come down one-handed and try is so deliberate an action as opposed to just when you would like tap one button and it would flip up. And the reason why that's frustrating is because one of my favorite um, navigation, navigational improvements in Android was when you would tap the multitasking button to toggle back and forth between two apps. So say you had contacts and you had another messaging app up, you would tap the square, you would go into your cards, you would tap the square again, and the most, the most recent app would pull up. It's kind of like Alt-Tab on a keyboard. And when you have gestures... Those gestures don't work in the same way, and they require much more action. And it's just another one of those things that reinforces why you need to have a case on your phone. Because if I were trying to do bottom corner, bottom chin gestures on an all glass device, it radically increases the likelihood that the phone will slip out of my fingers because I am pushing up against the bottom of the phone and look at how top heavy I have to hold this thing now, unless you stop and you dedicate two hands and your visual attention to operating your phone at all times. And that to me is a pain in the butt. Because we've made these prettier, because we've made them taller and skinnier, and because now we wanna have fancier gestures, you actually spend more time managing the use of your gadget, more attention managing the use of your gadget than actually just using your gadget. So I, I, I'm not terribly impressed with Android P's implementation of navigation. I don't think I'm gonna like this. And I, I think it, it calls into question some of the changes that we're making to UI that I think they're changed for change sake. They're changed so that people will stop complaining that Android feels stale. Um, they're not changes that actually, in my opinion, improve the user experience. And I think for a tiny minority of users who rely on accessibility um, controls, this is gonna make their phones harder to operate. You know, a home button for someone who, who might have arthritis or other similar musculature issues in controlling a flat, smooth glass display is going to have even more problems with, uh, with an all-gesture touchscreen interface. From Sean Vega Velez, that's why we need smaller body phones like what Sony offered. From Ellis2, have you tried the Samsung gestures? I have not. From B. Floyd, I'm not sure you understand the gestures. Swipe right to go to the last app. B. Floyd, I understand the gesture. The, the problem is it used to just be a tap. So do I have, yeah, I've got my BlackBerry up right here. So, oh, let me drop the screen brightness. So I'm in Google Drive. So I tap that. Oh, yeah, there we go. I tap that, and now I pull up my clock. My clock was the last use app. Tap, 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 tap. Go faster than the phone can actually react to. That's it. I don't have to move or flinch or slide or swipe or pull or anything. Tap, 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 tap. That's it. That's all you need to do to toggle the multitasking. I don't have to sit there and scan through cards when I've got two apps up and I want to toggle back and forth. So that's 
a gesture doesn't fix the gesture makes that worse. It doesn't make that better. And that's just one example. Again, I'm doing that <laughs> from LGH Doma. He's tapping that. <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious um uh, from from Marilyn Puig I have a ring holder attached to my case makes hanging onto my phone a breeze again you have to adapt and change the phone when there wasn't a problem before so I've got a little ring sticky um Andrew Andrew Wallace sent me a, a pop socket with the uh, Geek Book Club logo on it. I have to go through and complete the phone. The phone is less complete out of the box when it's a completely bezel-less glass back device. I have to put bezels back on it. These, these are bezels. I had to put these bezels back on the phone. I had to put a grippy material on the back of the phone. I had to pay money to do this. And now if I wanna have a better hold on this so that I can reach the bottom of my phone screen and not worry that the basic navigation aspect of hitting home or hitting multitasking or hitting back won't radically increase the likelihood of me dropping my super expensive premium pocket computer, I then have to add some type of grip, holder, stand, ring, something, to ensure that the most common navigational issues are, are addressed in a safe, as safe a fashion as possible for a lifestyle companion gadget. That makes this increasingly less complete, more expensive for the privilege of not being able to just pull a phone out of the box and start using it. And I have not had that kind of an issue on a phone like the BlackBerry Key 2. BlackBerry Key 2 fits in my one hand pretty great. When I want to go two thumbs to start typing, it's awesome. I can do all kinds of shortcuts. The thumb reaches that sensor, the fingerprint sensor in the space bar really easily without me dancing it around in my hand. And having the uh, navigation controls elevated means that I have even easier access to the things I do the most, the buttons I use the most on the phone. But I digress. <laughs> <laughs> um, Brett Carlton, what will amputees or people with mobility problems do? I, this is where I really hope voice action start start improving too, so that we can uh, we can work on that. Uh, Steve DeRoche, tap finger dancing, um, full screen experience. Sean Vega Vlez, I'll stick with navigation buttons. I think they're better. I really think they're better. Sharil Abdul Rahman, uh, Rahman. Uh, this is where the floating home button comes to play. That, for a certain number of people out there, makes a lot of sense. Um, where you would have just sort of like a floating dot on your screen and you could tap that to get to your navigation controls. I think, was it Huawei that did that first? I don't know who did it first. But I've seen a couple manufacturers you utilize a similar user-controlled floating navigation experience. I think something like that could play. Um, but unless you've built your operating system around gestures, like, kind of like BlackBerry did, um, BlackBerry OS X did. I didn't love those gestures either, but um, but those, th that navigation element um, was at least baked into the core idea of how to get around the operating system from the very beginning. Uh, that, to me, I think is the only way. Trying to do this halfway step that Google is doing I don't think works because most of these gestures, I want them to be towards the middle of the screen. And on something like the OnePlus 6, that's mostly just whether or not I wanna get to my app drawer. Uh, sorry, I can hold this up. But whether I wanna get to my app drawer or whether I wanna pull my notification shade, which I've always been able to do on, um, on Nova Launcher. And that's great, because you know, I, I don't wanna have to reach up to the top of a skinny screen when I'm going one-handed or reach down to the bottom just to get to, get to my app drawer. That's great. Now, maybe if we just went to one home screen and then we had lateral gestures from your home screen that could also get you into other things too, maybe that's what we could do. But that fundamentally changes how we use um, how we use Android. From Aditya Anil, oh yeah, an SGG logo pop socket. 
Unicorn Barf Pop Socket. Okay. I I I think Unicorn Barf might be my next um but my my next piece of merch. So I am not a great artist, but I'm working on a concept and a design, and hopefully we can come out with something to complement the Mega Pickle mugs out there. Uh, from Blue Malicious, get the regular Pixel Two. I think uh, for Pixel coverage for the Pixel Three, I'm going to skip the XL. I, I don't have any interest in going with the bigger bathtub unibrow notch bucket notch on the Pixel Three. So uh, that was a that was a recent story. Oh, I should have pulled that up from um, from my buddy Nick Gray. Nick Gray wrote an amazing editorial. I'm gonna pull that up right now so that we can we can talk about that too. Um, th- there's just been this this desire. the The Pixel Three coverage has been very interesting. In here it is from Fandroid. Here, let me go ahead and screen share this. So Nick Gray is a great dude. I mean, just a wonderful family man, and he's doing this amazing cross-country RV trek where he's also using a ton of mobile technology and pushing it to its absolute limits um, in in all of our consumer uh, consumer experience. I would highly recommend, and and he's sort of a freelance writer. You'll see him on a ton of different. Um, a uh, ton of different tech sites. Uh, I think he's written some stuff for Pocket now, Fandroid. I mean, he's just all over the place. And so he wrote this great editorial for Fandroid. The Pixel Ultra speculation is completely ridiculous. And there's been this push on YouTubers to talk about a potential Pixel 3 XL that won't have a notch and that the the pixels that we've seen are likely some kind of dummy unit that Google is using and that they're going to troll us and then the actual announcement is going to happen and we're all going to be so amazed that there won't be a notch. And that's a very compelling piece of wishful thinking. We all in the tech space, anyone who is internally consistent in their opinions, <laughs> not someone who's just some fanboy chasing SEO metrics and, and will only say nice things about the good companies that, that get to be the winners. Anyone who is internally consistent would prefer that the Pixel 3 XL not have the design implement, implementation of the notch that we've seen from these leaked devices. That's what we would prefer. But we don't have any compelling evidence to suggest that this is true. We don't have an FCC filing for an ultra that will omit this design accent. We don't have a dummy unit or a leak or anything like that. And I really do believe that some of the initial coverage was to Google's benefit so that we would all be talked out about the notch before the phone was officially announced. You know, you can kind of get the tech community used to a bad idea, but if that was by design, if Google had some hand in that kind of coverage, then it backfired because all it did was sort of rankle angry nerds and then just create an echo chamber of, or, over how much they didn't like this design accent. Short story, incredibly long. Um, when the next pixels are announced, I'm going to be siding with the smaller pixel. Um, I. I, I want to find more smaller phones to talk about. I don't think they get nearly as much attention. I don't think they get nearly as much love. And then I talk to my family and friends, and some people really like larger screens, but some people want something that fits better in a pocket. And they increasingly feel um, marginalized. They increasingly feel like there aren't good options because the industry has just decided that humongous stre- screens are the only trends worth pursuing. So like my brother's shopping for a phone and he has an old school Moto E. He doesn't want a bit. He has a Moto E. I mean, like literally it's it's I think it's smaller than my iPhone SE. Um, He wants something in in that size. He's actually trying to shop an Xperia XZ1 compact right now because he wants something kind of cheap, too. Um, That 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 isn't well represented. And I know a majority of the content that we see for the Pixel is probably going to focus on the XL so that some people can tell you you just need to get over the notch. And some people can say, I hate the notch. And that's going to drive a whole bunch of views either way because it's a divisive topic. So so we'll see. Um, but yeah, I highly recommend checking that out. Fandroid, the Pixel Ultra speculation is completely ridiculous as authored 
by Nick Gray. And follow Nick Gray as he takes his family across the country in an RV packed to the gills with awesome tech coverage. From Oberon Meister, foldable screens are the future, which means more Samsung coverage. And I will be ultra undies twisted cranky boy if our big solution for phones is to make them more fragile, less durable, (laughs) compromising battery life for larger screen sizes that fold up and don't really address the major issues of of, uh, our mobile technology lifestyle. From Shiny Nine Cat, don't buy the phone if you don't want it. I hate the notch too. I, I just so frustrated because this whole trend happened way faster than we had any good data on people being able to vote with their wallets. If you're basing this all on the iPhone, then I think you're missing the point. So I do want to get to the OnePlus 6T. Um, I spent a little more time talking uh, Andro- Android Pie. Um, than I really intended to, but in part because I really do want to throw a thumbs up to OnePlus. This beta is phenomenal. It's really good. I've I've played on some developer previews that that tank phone performance, or you kind of understand, okay, well, I can't do these things because it's just a developer preview or it's just a beta. This has been one of the smoothest experiences I've had in previewing a major operating system update, and I think OnePlus deserves a lot of credit for how they've implemented the changes to Android Pie while still maintaining a feel, which is near stock Android, but still OnePlus. Um, It's such a fine line. It's such, we're talking teeny little granular um, considerations. Uh, But no, I'm I'm, I'm very happy with that. So my my criticisms of Android Pie are not um, laid at the feet of OnePlus. I, I wanna give them some kudos there. Um, someone talking about the G7 camera? I, who, who's talking about cameras? I know about cameras. Live chat's moved on. Um, I, I can't. I, I, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. This live chat. I need a. I need like. I need a full time producer just to handle how many really great comments there are going through this live chat. So um, I did see from uh, from Chaos uh, 5338, hey Juan, any thoughts on a possible OnePlus 6T T-Mobile deal? Well, that's, we got to talk about OnePlus 6T. So very recent news um, cons- uh, confirmed. The new smartphone from OnePlus will fix one of the most annoying features of recent smartphones. This is from Business Insider. And we have pretty solid confirmation from the company that the OnePlus 6T will have an in-screen fingerprint sensor. So in addition to the water drop notch, the smaller notch that we saw on the Oppo R17, there were concerns about the OnePlus 6T not being a big enough update over the OnePlus 6. Because I think we're probably still going to see the same chipset, the Qualcomm 845, I think we're going to see similar battery capacity, similar build materials and quality. Again, we're basing a lot of this off of the R17, the Oppo phone, which shares a common frame. It's kind of like a, a Volkswagen and a Porsche endeavor. Um, but we're going to minimize the notch. So I put out a video just saying, what would you most like to see in a OnePlus 6? I then put out another video just saying, you know, this is what my most common design replies were. And most people said they wanted some kind of IP rating, wireless charging, and a bigger battery. Those were the top three requests for how they would fix a OnePlus 6 and make a OnePlus 6T. This is where OnePlus's strategy could be really compelling, having two devices per year. A lot of people criticize this because it's not enough time to really feel like substantial improvements have come. But this is, to me, a little like an iPhone number to an iPhone number S, you know, like an iPhone 4 to an iPhone 4S. It's not that it's a completely different phone. It's that you've taken what you've learned from the first phone, you've refined it, and you've improved a few things, and then you come out with this refreshed evolution of the same product. So a OnePlus 6T, which minimizes the notch, Still don't like the notch, but the water drop notch, which is like the essential widow's peak, is a huge step in the right direction, IMO, and can move the fingerprint sensor to under the screen 
is a compelling use of technology, is an interesting <clears throat> adaptation over the product we already have, and I think could be an, a, a fun refresh. You won't feel like buying the OnePlus 6 was as much of a compromise. Some of these things will be really nice, but the core performance of the OnePlus 6 remains unchanged. I think that's a good play. I think that's a smart play because it also gives us just that little bit of flexibility. Knowing that the OnePlus 6T is going to have an under-screen fingerprint sensor, I'm actually kind of okay maybe keeping the OnePlus 6 as my main OnePlus phone because I prefer the rear-mounted fingerprint sensor. Like, there could be a reason why someone would want to go out and buy a OnePlus 6 right now, knowing that the refresh is going to have some of these other things. I would prefer having the water drop notch um, rather than the the more sizable notch on the OnePlus 6, but this could be this could be a nice step. This this to me feels like if we don't get the bigger battery, we don't get wireless charging, or we don't get um, a, a rated uh, ingress protection, a rated uh, an IP rating you would still have something to look forward to on a OnePlus 6T. So when we combine all of that, if, if OnePlus can pull off a carrier deal in the United States, this would be a phenomenally important year for OnePlus. They are not the epic bang for buck enthusiast company that they started out as. They've walked away from an almost no-margin device that drums up a whole bunch of discussion among tech elite enthusiasts with a baller CPU and other compromised specs. So much of this phone has caught up to actual flagship-grade performance. They might be ahead of the curve in the United States on an in-screen fingerprint sensor, they might be ahead of the curve on minimizing the impact of a notch, which they could point to and make fun of an iPhone for having bat ears on a, on a $1,000 phone. And they could launch at a high enough price point. Because I do believe a OnePlus 6T with a carrier deal will be more expensive than the OnePlus 6. But the psychology on that is vital. Because if they launch closer to the $600 price tag, then they will be thought of as a premium product by consumers. This is something that worked out well for Google. Remember, from the Nexus to the Pixel, there wasn't a lot of change or improvement to what delineated a Nexus from a Pixel. But that price got a lot higher. You know, the first Pixel didn't even have optical image stabilization in the camera. I mean, it, was, it really was just the evolution of what the Nexus would have been in a fancier, prettier shell, but not any substantial improvement to build quality or features or hardware or anything. But they charged more. And when you charge more, consumers go in, oh, well, that's the Google iPhone. So it's priced the same as a Google iPhone, so it must be just as good as an iPhone. For whatever reason, if you're way under that price-performance ratio, consumers look at it and go, oh, well, that's a cheap phone. I don't want a cheap phone. I want a nice phone. A OnePlus 6, uh, I mean, a OnePlus 6T on T-Mobile at $599 with maybe, you know, maybe it's $599 for, you know, like uh, the 8-gig model as opposed to the 6-gig model in terms of RAM. Maybe it's that. I don't know. But with this tech... Apple can't give you an underscreen fingerprint sensor. Samsung can't give you an underscreen fingerprint sensor. LG has a bigger notch. The Google Pixel has a bathtub notch. The OnePlus 6 has a refined, organic water drop of a notch. It's beautiful. It's seamless. It's, it's exciting. It's tantalizing. And it's $50 cheaper than a, a smaller Pixel 3. <laughs> no? That, to me, could be a major turning point in the reputation, the visibility of this brand, that could be huge. And it would instantly catapult Oppo OnePlus to being the premier Chinese manufacturer in the United States. I mean, w without hyperbole, that's a huge move. 
Huawei and ZTE, who I, I think were making compelling, interesting, and competitive products. I mean, Huawei phones were better phones than OnePlus's. Um, they they didn't have the political clout to make that push, and now OnePlus could could launch. OnePlus could be the company that that properly breaks a Chinese phone in the United States. Um, oh, so many comments about this. From Oberon Meister, LOL, what about that Essential Phone's water drop notch? So I've been calling the Essential Phone the Widow's Peak because it had the flat sides and it kind of curved as opposed to the more sculpted sides that we're going to see from the Oppo and, and on the OnePlus. I don't know. We'll see. Um, oh, from LS2, I wish it was the Find X. Oh, man. Uh, I, if, if we see any kind of traction, OnePlus 6T, T-Mobile, some kind of consumer push, it gets some momentum and it becomes a desirable brand. I hope OnePlus will examine some of the crazier, um, some of the crazier design implementations from Oppo into future OnePlus products to make that the defining characteristic moving forward. Um, from DVZ and Media, the 6P camera was amazing. I think it was good. Um, but Google really hasn't been a huge champion of camera hardware. I, I think when you look at Nexus and Pixels, they're, they're big play, and they deserve every bit of praise they get for camera processing, software processing. But you can take that camera app to any other camera and get some pretty great results out of it. Um, it's not unique to the Nexus. It's not unique to the, to the Pixel. Um... So I'm seeing comments about people trying to DM me, and I, I, I don't know. But Aditya Anil, Widow's Peak, Water Drop, Bathtub, Classic Apple. Do we have a notch brochure from which OEMs we can select from? <laughs> um, <laughs> that's hilarious. All right. Um, Oberon Meister getting rid of a selfie camera would be a really bold move. I would appreciate it so much. Okay. I mean, the thing is, I do think you there is some call for, like, a selfie camera for video calling, you know, a practical consideration, but I, I, I can't say I like taking photos of myself from the selfie camera. The rear cameras are always better, so when I want to capture this likeness, I uh, I definitely want the superior optics, uh, not not the uh, the compromised, less good camera. Uh, okay, so we've talked about that. Real quick, I want to dive through just a couple quick um, Huawei stories. Uh, 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 let me get this up here. This is from PC Perspective, and this is following up on a couple of recent stories from Anantech and a couple other outlets. Kieran cheating extends to Geekbench P20 Pro tested. Uh, just a quick wrap up on on the TLDR on their story that the P20 Pro and the Kirin 970 in there seems to detect when it's using a benchmarking app, gives radically better numbers when, or not radically, uh, substantially better numbers, noticeably better numbers in terms of synthetic benchmarks when the app details that it's a benchmarking app. So you can take the same benchmarking app and just remove the name of the app, and then suddenly your performance scores drop. So Huawei's... Um, Huawei's explanation for this, uh, let me get this back. This was a joint statement released by Huawei and UL, um, explained that its smartphones use an artificial intelligent resource scheduling mechanism. Because different scenarios have different resource needs, the latest Huawei handsets leverage innovative technologies such as artificial intelligence to optimize resource allocation in a way so that the hardware can demonstrate its capabilities to the fullest extent while fulfilling user demands across all scenarios. So, what, what do we think about synthetic benchmarks knowing that so many companies will alter the performance of their phones when they detect that a benchmark is being run, right? I kind of believe if you're on, like, speedtest.net your your internet service provider or your carrier sees that you're running a speed test and it just gives you like the full ping the full boost whatever you can get the fastest scores possible but then you go and stream your netflix and they throttle your netflix um 
what about something like a benchmarking app, some sort of synthetic benchmark? Do do we care about that? Do we want to see what the no holds barred full speed of a current uh, chipset might resemble, or are we are we frustrated by a tier of performance that you're probably not likely to hit um, in your daily use? What what do we think? So from Elias2, benchmarks are not accurate, really never trusted them. From Renato Laporte, if you're gaming, you kind of don't care about the battery, so it can boost the cores to the highest speed. Um, that would be nice. Sharil Abdu, Abdul, Abdul Rahman, synthetic benchmarks are in a way bragging numbers. Since it's now being used in marketing stuff, companies will fluff it up. Um, Chaos5338, the problem with synthetic benchmarks, uh, test benches, is that it doesn't fully capture outside performance. Completely agree. Um, Renato replying to his, I mean, continuing his, his own, uh, thread there. The thing is how long the phone can hold this speed. If it can hold for more than half an hour, I don't call it cheating, just managing. And that's another important thing too, is the difference between sort of a burst of performance and what's actually sustainable. Um, Oberon Meister, I, I agree with this. I think benchmarks should have a random ID after install. So the phone would not recognize, recognize it as what it is. Um, from Chaos, it is the fastest way to gauge a phone's performance. TK Bay, benchmarks are not real life. <laughs> um, that is that is completely accurate. Um, th this is this is why I've been trying to find other aspects of phone performance that I can use to detail. So things like video editing, video rendering, um, using plugins to stabilize video. I'm, I'm trying to dig into what are some other real world performance things that we can point to. Because if, it, like, let's say I go to a content creator, someone who's really into vlogging, and I tell them this phone's really powerful because I ran a benchmarking app which let me look at how many frames per second it could play a game. Well, does a vlogger really care about how many FPS they can get in Fortnite? I would say no, and that that type of performance doesn't necessarily have a meaningful impact, that kind of disclosure have a meaningful impact on what they might use their phone for. So um, from Aditya Anil, uh, responding to TK Bay, we need that on a shirt. <laughs> Maybe a future piece of merch. <laughs> That's some gadget guy. Uh, quote, TK Bay. <laughs> So what, what do we, what other things can we actually measure? Uh, if, if I set up a video to render, if I render a 4K video from my phone, I can time it, right? I can tell you how long one phone took to render the same video as another phone. I can tell you why, you know, like you can do it on a BlackBerry, but it's going to take you twice as long to render this video on a BlackBerry as it will on uh, an LG V30. So what other things can we point to in this discussion? What other what other data points can we really measure? Because I kind of feel like we get a little hung up on the tech, the tech echo chamber. Uh, I mean, I want to say the tech circle jerk, but it's more the tech echo chamber on things like speed tests. So I'm going to compare the iPhone, the iPhone X, the iPhone 10 against the Galaxy Note 9, and I'm going to run 15 apps, and I'm going to see which phone can run through 15 apps the fastest. To me, that's kind of the same problem we have with synthetic benchmark numbers, because that doesn't really reflect a scenario that's likely to happen in real-world performance, even from some of the heaviest, the most hardcore phone users. And that's why... You know, having eight gigabytes of RAM in a phone is nice, but hasn't really been a deal breaker when I go back down to four gigabytes of RAM and I'm editing and rendering 4K video. I'm writing scripts in Microsoft Word. I'm recording high quality audio in programs like Audio Evolution Mobile. And I don't feel like that has been a major constraint to the way that I use my phone. 
So uh, I'd be really curious to see what other things that you guys would want to take a look at. Um, I don't know. Is there is there a real world impact on having a Qualcomm 845 and six to eight gigabytes of RAM on office applications? And is there a way that we can test that? Is there a real world impact on having a Qualcomm 845 versus a Qualcomm 660 it, as it pertains to photography? You know, and how do we measure that? Um, Oberon Meister, one of the tech reviewers I'm subscribed to, makes 15 minute long videos where he just opens apps, switches between them and such. And I think it's more, it is a much more accurate representation than benchmarks from DVZN Media. I've never opened up 15 apps that fast. <laughs> from TK Bay, compressing files. Okay, file compression. That could actually be something kind of interesting to measure outside the purview of a benchmarking app. I've been doing video renderings. Um, frames per second on gameplay over 10 minutes. Okay, so again, can you sustain your your FPS? Uh, running a stabilizer on a 4K video, which which I hipped you to, TK. TK Bay and I have, have bonded. We've become pals over uh, video stabilizing <laughs> on Google Photos. <laughs> um, let's see... Video encoding, processing Lightroom photos from RAW to JPEG. I wonder how I could set up a timer on that. I think the best way, that's from Tech Leathercraft. I think the best way that I would I would be able to do that would be to literally shoot video of processing a RAW photo and then measuring the number of video frames it took. That could maybe be some solution there from chaos 5338 upload speeds and cell antenna performance i do cover that in my reviews um that's critically important to me when i'm using a cell phone to know that i'm at least getting some kind of average performance on networking equipment and how well it reacts because my um i use mesh wi-fi so i should have pretty good wi-fi coverage throughout my house occasionally i run into some phones the network management does not like mesh wi-fi from LS2, I love TK Bay's swimming videos. We need more underwater benchmarks, I feel. Um, from Sheryl, how about managing thousands of photos in a device? The only problem with managing thousands of photos on a device is that I actually have to load a device with thousands of photos. Considering I shoot tens of gigabytes of photos and videos for my actual camera reviews, I might not <laughs> have the bandwidth to do a massive photo management test. But I'll look into what I can do for that. <laughs> um, what mesh network am I using? DVZN Media, I am using an Eero, and I did a review on this channel too. I like it a lot. Um, there are huge pros and cons, and depending on what your needs are, uh, Google Mesh is probably a little bit easier to set up. Um, but Eero, I think, is a little easier to manage because they give you a few more tools to manage. But then if you want like legit hardcore, I have gaming style needs networking, then I would maybe look at Asus. Um, Asus, uh, their, their most recent updates can turn regular Asus gaming routers into mesh networks. And that's very compelling. So, um, uh, let's see. I've got one other thing here. And then let me get that out of the way there. Okay, so the last thing that I wanted to showcase before we talk iPhone um, and use the last like 15, 20 minutes of this to chat Apple. Uh, one last little uh, Huawei story. The GSM Arena has leaks on the Huawei Mate 20 Pro, uh, a big unibrow notch, but supposedly multi-camera notch. So there will be 3D sensing material at the top. The Mate 20, not the Mate 20 Pro will feature a water drop notch, but the Mate 20 Pro will finally, uh, will, will move us up to a higher resolution screen, usually reserved for Porsche design. Um, one of the things that we're looking at though is Huawei continuing to push curves on the sides of the device, on the sides of the screen, so that this will have curved glass and a curved display. Not my favorite design accent, and one of the things that increasingly I miss my Mate 9 um, for having sort of a, an easier hold on the gadget. So uh, just some some things to be uh, kind of on the lookout for. This is a phone I'm very curious to to get my hands on. 
uh, I did a full camera review. I did a 20 minute camera review on the P20 Pro. And I think we'll, we'll likely see similar photography performance from the Mate, but I'm hoping that we'll be able to address some of the issues that I had with, with uh, image stabilization and video. So with that being a concern, that's also where some of that benchmarking story for the Kirin 970 was called into question. Because if Huawei is manipulating the benchmarking numbers on the 970, isn't it entirely likely that some of the early benchmarks and some of the early numbers we've seen on the Kirin 980 are likely compromised? Um, and so Anantech has a great write-up on the Kirin 980. I would highly recommend digging into that so that you can kind of get a handle on what's going on there. Last week's podcast, I did a whole breakdown on the big core, big fast cores, big slower cores, smaller, little slower cores, power management cores, MPU cores, uh, cake cores, and candy cores, and all kinds of cores in the next chipsets but we do have some issues that you know the image processing probably might not be up to the same standards as what qualcomm's going to put on we'll have to see so we'll uh We'll, we'll have to uh, to play with that. Renata Laporte, any noise from Huawei PR? Are you pals with them? I'd love to see you taking the Mate 20 Pro for a spin. I'm going to reach out to them. I'm hoping I can spend some time with it. Um, we'll, we'll see how that goes. I, uh, I was getting a lot of contact from them when the Mate 10 was trying to push into the United States. And we ultimately ended up doing a segment on the Mate 10 on Newegg. Uh, I, I kind of helped produce that. And we showed off the Mate 10 on Fox. Now, one of the frustrating things is whenever I start leveraging Newegg and actual broadcast television, these companies bend over backwards to be super sweet and nice. Then when I say, but I also want to see if I can throw you hundreds of thousands of views on YouTube, can, can we talk about a, a review device, especially close to the launch of the device when it's the most timely to talk about, then I don't even get replies. I don't, they don't even answer my emails. So um, I'm hoping... I'm hoping that this will be lined up right there. Otherwise, this this is a phone that's actually on my list. Like, I might try and import it, but that's going to be way later. And if my importing a Mate 20 is funded off of Patreon contributions, then obviously I'm going to focus on the majority of that coverage being for Patreon audiences. Uh, same thing. Like, if I were to buy a Note 9, that would likely be because of the monies that have been contributed on Patreon. I'm not going to just sit there and like, okay, well, all these patrons, you know, really helped me out. So now I'm going to make sure that YouTube gets to demonetize my videos publicly. So we'll, we'll see. Uh, guys, if we're having some fighting in the live chat, I, I, I really feel like I don't want to have to get in there and start muting people. So you know who you are. You know what's going on. Just take a breath. Walk away from the keyboard for just a minute. My show will still be running for another 10 minutes or so. Come back and let's see if we can be cool. My audience is cool. I like my audience cool. We're all, we're all all right. So let's chill. I'll cut that out of the audio feed, but I'll put more commercials in the audio podcast. <laughs> like you being able to buy one of these amazing mega pickle mugs that I need to drink a water. Sorry, I'm going to just seamlessly build this into a, a merch plug. <sighs> okay. So, um, uh, Beto Survivor Max, I've been out of the loop for a bit, so did you leave pocket now? I'm going to table that question. I, I feel like we've addressed this a little bit in previous podcasts, but ask me in some other forum and we'll talk about pocket now. Um, uh, let's get this out of the way here. Okay, so let's wrap this up. How are we feeling about Apple in the year 2018? We are going to have the major um, announcement for the next generation of iPhones in two days, uh, September 12th. I'm going to try to uh, do my normal Twitter shenanigans where I'll comment on their announcement, like I'll live tweet it, like everybody else is going to be live tweeting it. Um, what do we want to see in an iPhone? I, I've really struggled with the types of videos that I want to put out on Apple. Um, oh, I don't, I almost always have it within arm's reach. 
and for once during the live stream, I don't because my main iOS driver over the last two years has been the iPhone SE. I still think it's the the top tier, the absolute best implementation of hardware and software I've ever seen out of Cupertino. But this year, like with the the Google Pixel, in, in just terms of what I feel is important to cover on my channel, and this is one of the conversations I had with my patrons, uh, patrons on Patreon. <laughs> I tried to combine patrons and Patreon, and that failed. Um, but this is why that strategy session was so important. And if you guys want to join that strategy discussion, that is, that's open to patrons. Um, I feel it's important to have, from the company who makes Android, a flagship product that demonstrates what Google thinks is important for smartphone users. So I'm likely going to pick up the smaller Google Pixel. I don't know if I'm going to keep it long term. If, if that's the kind of conversation we want to have about those types of products, or if it will be one of those quick, let me review it and then flip it, or let me review it and then maybe use it as a prize, as a giveaway for Patreon. Because again, that's going to be funded from Patreon contributions. Um, I really feel it's important that I have the same thing for iOS. And so what we're looking at is probably going to be a three-tier strategy from Apple, right? Uh, I believe... I really do believe what we'll see is a pair of iPhone XSs or iPhone XSs. So like we had the iPhone 10 for 2017, it makes sense that Apple would release an iPhone XS as a follow-up to what they put out last year. And so we'll see an iPhone XS. I think we'll also see an iPhone XS Max or an iPhone XS Plus or some type of larger form factor iPhone device. What I'm not entirely sure we'll see is the same kind of iPhone SE, iPhone XSE, iPhone XC has been rumored, so that we'll see a smaller, a, a teeny iPhone, but again, sort of still following in the design language and the design footsteps of the iPhone 10, just a smaller form factor mid-ranger priced iPhone device. And for Apple, that could be a $600 phone. <laughs> From LS2, iPhone XLMNNOP. <laughs> um, from Ronald Sims, I'm for reviewing it and giving it away to me. I mean, <clears throat> patrons. <laughs> Um, from Panda Dan, does it? This is on uh, on uh, Periscope. From Panda Dan, does it make sense to upgrade from the iPhone X from 2017? I don't believe so. I think increasingly it is very difficult to justify a one year upgrade. From one year to the next, there are precious few phones now where I feel like that that felt like a substantial upgrade. Every now and then, you run into an off window, like. LG, somehow, from the LG G5 to the LG G6, we saw a fundamentally different design language and a much better uh, stability going from the G5 to the G6. But the G6 also had a slightly older chipset at launch. So going from the G6 to the G7 also felt like a reasonable one-year update. Very, very infrequently do I find that kind of chain where you can point from one year to the next. I think if you're if you're using an iPhone 10, I'm not sure we're going to see anything so phenomenally substantially different on the iPhone 10s or the iPhone XS. What I will say though is the S series phones always tend to be the better phones. I don't think any first year number phone has ever been a great buy. Every, from from the iPhone 5 to the iPhone 7, every single substantial number update has had major issues that the S series has fixed. Battery issues on the iPhone 5, uh, bend gate and uh, touch disease on the iPhone uh, on the iPhone 6. And this just continues up. Oh, iPhone 4, the iPhone from the iPhone 4, you had antenna gate. So if you're already rocking an iPhone 10, I think you're probably going to be fine. I, I think the, the subtle improvements likely won't 
change the overall experience of using an iPhone substantially. I, I think it is better to wait out at least two years, or if you can, maybe look at how you can shift your iPhone strategy to get on the S series of devices instead of the primary number series of devices. So um, from LGH Delta, even low to mid-range SOCs are pretty fast now. Upgrading within a year makes less and less sense. And for iPhone users especially, look at your usage, look at your behavior, because A series chipsets are phenomenally powerful. Like from the A9 forward, like these things are, I, I Apple has a good faith argument to be made for their chipsets being near desktop grade computing platforms. But what are you doing with your phone that requires that much horsepower? Are you editing and rendering video? Because that would be a, li a quality of life improvement to keep getting the fastest chipset when you're looking at producing out in the field. This made a big difference to me. It's one of the things I can point to going from a Qualcomm 820 to a Qualcomm 845 is when I do, when I shoot 4K video that is not stabilized, say off of the wide angle lens on an LG, my time to stabilize that video has dramatically dropped. So it used to be almost two to one, now it's almost one to one. So if I have a three minute video from a wide angle lens on an LG and I stabilize it in Google Photos, that used to take six to eight minutes to stabilize, now it's taking like four. That is a quality of life improvement that for me is worth buying a newer phone. If you're not doing that kind of stuff, you're probably fine with an iPhone 6S. <laughs> and I don't mean to belittle like people who wanna buy newer or fancier gadgets, but really what gets you through the day my iPhone SE running um, the newest iOS, uh, iOS updates is a baller little Mighty Mouse of a phone. That thing, that, that the thing lags for no app. It, 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 it's crazy great performance. Does a pretty reasonable job of shooting 4K video. And, and I use it in a lot of like audio situations. Like I still have my Sennheiser clip mic. You know, this there are some times where I still like bringing out the Sennheiser clip mic. And then the iPhone SE becomes this great little audio pack that I can record super high quality audio from. I mean, it's it's such a great little teeny discreet phone. I really like it. Um, but I'm fine. I'm fine with that level of horsepower. I'm fine with that level of performance. It does the gig exactly like how I think it should do. And this is a phone that's years old and still getting updates, which I need to celebrate Apple for. That is one of the things that I, I still think they do, they do better than any other manufacturer in the smartphone space. Uh, Aditya Anil, only Jaime legit needs an annual Apple device upgrade. That dude hustles like crazy. Also, because, you know, like maybe he's dropped a few. <laughs> maybe he needs the new one just because uh, he's cracking the back glass on his iPhones now. From Chaos5338, well, for some people, they feel they like they need to upgrade their phone so that it fits better with their Apple family of products. But with software support, that argument doesn't hold water. If your phone, if your iPhone 6S is running a reasonably up-to-date build of iOS 12, when iOS 12 finally gets pushed into the mainstream uh, update line, you're already on board. The, the thing that you start losing out on when you go that old are some of the improvements to very specific and niche features. So, like, my iPhone SE is still use is still able to do augmented reality apps. Like this was a big part of the iPhone 8 and iPhone 10 launch. Oh, we're really working on on AR core, AR kit. I can't remember who has what. Um, augmented reality and doing all this cool stuff. But all of those software updates and improvements made it back to my iPhone SE. So if I want to go out and run around a park like an idiot on AR runner, which I absolutely love, I can still do that on my SE, and my SE is a better phone for running around holding up the camera because it's smaller. So it's it's tough. I mean, like, I want to say, like, I want to be excited about new technology, and I want to be excited about progress and evolution and how these things are going to make our lives better, but I really do think we're at peak smartphone right now. The current metaphor for how we interact with apps and services has not changed since the Qualcomm 820 has not changed since the iPhone 6s 
and in many ways has gotten regressive. Things like headphone jacks or notches on your screens have, have actually impacted the experience, not improved the experience, and we just get used to it. So I'm looking forward to spending some time with an, a new iPhone because last year for the iPhone 10, I was tasked with, re with reviewing the iPhone 8 Plus. So I didn't spend any time with an iPhone 10 last year, and PocketNow sent the iPhone 10 to Jaime. Um, so I've been iPhone-less for the better part of 2018, outside of my iPhone SE. Um, but then I, this this is going to be this is going to be a big leap. So I'll be going from an iPhone SE to an iPhone 10s. That to me feels like that's worth talking about in terms of upgrades and improvements and stuff that will hopefully make the experience nicer. From Joel GJ, why can't they make an iPhone SE 2 with legacy features? Because uh, it's Apple. <laughs> I mean, the answer ultimately is because it's Apple, but I, 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 I don't have any better answer for that. There seems to still be a market for iPhone 5 style phones. It's just dwindling and it's diminishing and we know that that market is getting smaller. But I would love to have an iPhone SE 2 exact same form factor again. I still think it's the nicest phone that Apple has ever made. No camera bulge, clean modern lines, flat edges, just so pretty. Um, but th th they need to move on and they want to focus on glass backs and wireless charging. So I think what we'll see is that iPhone XC, where they're going to bring back the C moniker, which was a total fail for the iPhone 5C. Um, but now I think they've they've distanced themselves enough that they can try and relaunch a budget brand iPhone under that kind of a moniker. From Chaos 5338, I would like an iPhone SE 2 for my dad, but he might have to upgrade to the 8 or whatever is the smallest iPhone. Yeah, I, I think a lot of people are going to be in that boat. I sold family and friends, so many people on iPhone SEs when that phone came out. Because I had so many family that were still on iPhone 5s. Not even iPhone 5Ss, but like iPhone 5s. You know, you could keep an iPhone running for a long time. And then you would go and say like, way faster processor, way better camera, and it totally fits in all of the cases that you, and cases and cradles and mounts that you already own. So don't get the iPhone 6, <laughs> Bendgate, get the iPhone 5, uh, get the iPhone SE. Awesome. Um... From Sharil Abdul Rahman, budget iPhone equals Samsung S8 price. Uh, emoticon with the tongue sticking out. I do, I do believe that when we talk about a mid-range or iPhone, we will be talking OnePlus prices, at least. Um, it, it's very likely that the what you can get a Galaxy S9 for on a deal through a carrier will probably be the launch price for an iPhone XC. And that's the again. That's an, an, a, a great example of the lobster pot effect. Now that we've had an iPhone that costs a thousand dollars, five to six hundred dollars is a mid ranger. As far as Apple's concerned, they're giving you a budget phone at six hundred dollars. Their premium phone is a thousand, so that's how we crank the market up. Now, what's interesting about that, I, I, I don't have a link for it. Um, it's an article I read over the weekend, and I'll see if I can find it. If I can, I'll add it to the, uh, to the video description. There was a story that for 2019, after the Galaxy S10 launch, that Samsung is going to pivot and make a bigger play at their mid-range market. And that future um, new features on their phones will actually launch first on budget brands within Samsung, Galaxy A series, Galaxy J series, and then they'll build those up to be launched on Galaxy S series as opposed to the other way around. I'm not sure that that's what that strategy might look like, but it was an interesting little piece of information from an obscure blog talking to some, you know, uh, mid middle tier Samsung executive that I think they could they could probably garner some interesting traction on that really trying to follow in like what makes a Nokia so successful right now HMD with the Nokia brand is um, pushing towards making the experience for people who can't buy a thousand dollar phone less painful OnePlus still I think deserves a lot of credit for making a nice phone under six hundred dollars, 
which doesn't feel overly hamstrung or compromised for what a majority of smartphone fans are going to um, are, are going to enjoy. If Samsung can can leverage their manufacturing to also rejoin that conversation in earnest, then I think that could be really compelling. Like from uh, for it for it, Samsung's J and A line seem weak in these past few years. Doubling down on that should be uh, should be an exciting move for a company like Samsung. Ronald Sims, watch a video about someone saying that premium devices is a bargain for $1,000. Didn't we notice a few people talking about the Galaxy Note? Like, NBD, it's $1,000. Didn't we see a few? Weren't there some people who were complaining about $1,000 phones who sort of changed their tune a little bit when they got their hands on a Galaxy Note? Didn't that happen a little don't we think? But it does make me it does make me anxious because I, I hope that we see improvement. I wholly expect that like an LG V40 should be a premium tier device. I wholly expect that phone to start creeping north. I just hope that we stay under $899. <laughs> My wallet can't handle so many of these crazy expensive products. It's tough, and I really, really don't want to have to play that game where I buy a phone and then return it after a week after I shoot a whole bunch of videos on it because those videos never turn out well. Um, I can't get a sense of what using a phone is like if I use it for 10 days and then have to return it because, you know, it's just crazy. For it, for it, the Note 10 is going to be $2,000. And and, and so I, I expect to start seeing laptop-grade prices on these devices if they can fulfill laptop-grade use. But I really want to see a company. That was the other rumor. Okay, so we got to wrap this up. This podcast is already running long. But um, <laughs> from the DTNL, and LG V40 at $898. <laughs> As long as it stays under eight ninety nine, I just shot myself in the foot. Um, Razer two, Razer two electric boogaloo, um, rumors, leaks, some data points that this is a real phone. It is really coming, and that uh, so far what we've seen suggests that Razer might be keeping the sixteen by nine display and the squarer design accents of having stereo speakers on the front face. Folks, if they can clean up some of the other issues that the Razer 1 phone had, and we're not talking substantial changes, but just some attention to the camera hardware and the camera app, that hardware-software synergy, some subtle improvements there. Um, I would like to see a Razer dongle that is properly capable of the 24-bit THX quality sound that they've been hyping. I was a little disappointed in the performance of the Razer dongle when I tested it, and Oddly, the Google dongle in some instances can outperform Razer's solution at half the price. Um, this, to me, a Razer phone coming out, especially opposite the Asus ROG phone, the the what is it, the Sagus or whatever that I don't know is actually ever become a real product. But this could be a real for me phone. We're gonna say a game, a phone can be focused on gaming. A Razer phone, 16 by 9 aspect ratio with plenty of room for me to reach onto the screen, that the bezels actually fulfill a usage, and that that usage is good audio, good speakers pointing right at my face. This could be a very serious player and something I definitely want to spend some time talking about. So uh, that's probably about as exciting a place to to end this um, as we can. Oberon Meister, there are aftermarket dongles worth your attention, Juan. I know there are. I, I have a finite amount of time to test all of this stuff. <laughs> and I want to see, what I really want to see is a company that I love, like a Sennheiser or an Audio-Technica or an AKG, if that label still has any autonomy under Samsung's uh, ownership. Uh, Bear Dynamic, uh, Bang & Olufsen. I want to see a legit audio brand come out with a, a USB-C dongle that just really blows me away. 
not just something that kind of matches the performance that we should expect from like the pixel dongle but does it a, a dollar cheaper or does it in a better braided cable i want something that can replace a uh, standalone DAC, you know, or, you know, some of these bigger devices that we've been sort of carrying around with our phones. So we'll see. But if Razer can continue building a little bit of a fan base, especially because, and, and I'm going to need your guys's and gals' help in this chat, because if Razer comes out with a 16 by 9 phone, what do we expect the reply will be from tech enthusiasts who will completely miss the point of what Razer is trying to accomplish. Oh my god, bezels! Oh my god, 16 by 9 when you need 2 by 1. They'll completely eclipse... They won't review the phone for what it is. They'll only sit there and talk about what the phone isn't. And then you'll get a bunch of, oh, better luck next year, Razer, and you'll, like, you'll have missed out on something really important. But if Razer can pull that off, a compelling device... Good thermal management, because you need that in a gaming uh, gaming product. And maybe give us a lap dock, a Motorola-style Motorola, Motorola style lap dock. That would be huge. Project Linda. If they can pull off Project Linda, I, I desperately wish any company would really take a look at what Samsung is doing with DeX, what Microsoft did with Continuum, and what Huawei is doing with their HDMI mode, and just dock a laptop powerful phone into a proper clamshell computing device and use my phone as the touchpad for that would be so epic. I want that so, so much. So um, uh, that, that to me is probably the, the whole thing. Uh, from Aditi Anil, they will probably shove it aside like they did with the LG G7. We'll probably praise the speakers and 120 hertz display, but we'll be distracted by the ROG phone. Even if they're not as distracted by the ROG phone, they'll probably make some sort of dismissive, uh, you know, I mean, if you want it, you can buy it. Uh, you know, everyone should get what they use. But I'm, I'm an elite, uh, educated tech consumer, so I only use this brand. And they'll sit there and make sort of, disingenuous comparisons to things that are already SEO winners. Creative school. What about the red hydrogen? Is it the, is it change the, will it change the market of camera smartphones? I hope it will. Uh, what we saw with the Huawei P20 pro is there is a phenomenal improvement to using larger camera sensor hardware on a smartphone. We should not be surprised by this because the Lumia 1020 showed us years ago that you get a, fin a, a s significant improvement to smartphone photography when you use a larger camera sensor. So if RED can continue doing that too, then I will be very excited to talk about a RED, um, especially from a content creation standpoint. It, it won't be a daily driver phone for most people out there. But again, I want more companies to look at being a king of a niche market. Asus and Razer going head-to-head -head in gaming will deliver humongous benefits to every other Android user who likes to play games on their phone and could potentially bring tremendous benefits for people who want to use their phones as their primary computers. That is, that is easily in the realm of possibility today. I write scripts, record high-quality audio, shoot 4K video, edit 4K video, stabilize 4K video, render 4K video, and upload to services like YouTube all from a phone. It is completely doable. If we could make that experience a little bit nicer by giving me a laptop clamshell dock to put my phone in, there will be plenty of times I won't need to also travel with a gaming laptop just to get my work done. We really can do this now. We just need the be we just need the hardware to properly support it. Let's do it, right? This is awesome. So, folks, um, I I will be kind of uh, floating around the twitters uh, on Wednesday, uh, September September twelfth. The Apple iPhone event is going to kick off. I'm wholly expecting to see a three tier iPhone strategy. I think uh, we might also see a watch refresh, but you know I don't think that's going to be the the major talking point. Apple needs to clean up their product lines. They need to uh, express to consumers what the new 
vision for iPhones will be moving into 2018 and 2019. And I think it's going to be a three device strategy, a mid ranger somewhere around five to $600 for the iPhone XC. And then we'll have the iPhone XS and the iPhone XS Max Plus Big Edition. And I think that's what we're going to likely kick off with. So uh, join me on Twitter uh, so we can talk about all of the iPhone-y goodness uh, coming up on Wednesday. Then for the uh, for the main channel, I'm going to have some more audio kit to review. I'm wrapping up my review of the Sound Blaster X, the SBX G6, an awesome little uh, portable USB sound card. This is like taking their high-end internal PCI sound card tech and cramming it into a USB uh, enclosure that can also work on Android phones, which is phenomenal. Um, but huge internal processing, and it does have some fun tricks up its sleeves for gamers. So when you're listening to game audio and you really want spatial awareness and stuff, some really cool tech going into there. And then on the budget side, I, I just got these. Uh, these are the uh, uh, KZ ES4. Years ago, I did a review of the KZ8, the KZ ATE uh, monitor style in, in-ear monitor headphones. Um, at the time, those earbuds were like $15 to $20. Now, they're ES4s. These are dual driver in-ear monitor style earbuds that sell for 20 bucks online. So I'm going to have a review, a short, a short review on these out on the channel pretty soon too. Um, so uh, some cool stuff there too. I just, they, they shouldn't sound this good for 20 bucks. That's what I'll say. Uh, and then there are some really nice quality of life improvements over the KZ8 that I, I really liked, too. So um, all, all the news that's fit to ramble on about, uh, some fun products coming your way for, for reviews and commentary and coverage. And then, of course, expanded commentary and discussion and behind the scenes production diaries and all of my camera and audio deep dive reviews on uh, Patreon.com slash some gadget guy, YouTube.com slash Juan Bagnell and around the rest of the Internet at some gadget guy on the Facebooks, the Twitters and the Instagrams. Thank you so much for everybody joining this uh, this live stream this chat, this discussion. I really appreciate the comments and uh, especially because we spent uh, quite a bit of time dealing with some political news blocks at the top and that looked like some good chat there. So um, so yeah, let's keep doing more of that. Less squabbling, fighting, and, uh, and arguing in the live chat, but fun, spirited discussion and debate. That I like. Uh, and then be on the lookout at the end of the week where I do my first creator chat with TK Bay. Uh, talking about how he got into tech reviewing. It'll be a podcast on the SGGQA podcast feed, that RSS feed. And hopefully soon we can unlock ad-free podcasts on the Patreon too so that I don't have to cut up all of my shows with extra ads for patrons. So uh, thanks so much for watching. I hope you have a phenomenal start to your tech week. And you know you can find me next week on the SGGQA podcast Monday morning tech chat show. Be well, and I'll talk to you soon.